So we've got, again, two degrees of freedom. This time I've got different masses and different uh, uh, stiffnesses. And I've left them in terms of k. I've not given these things values. So I'm going to be working this stuff out in terms of k and m. And so in this case, f2 is 0. My forcing function is a linear increasing force. Okay, Some constant times by time is going to be a straight line. Okay. Um, from time is 0. And obviously, I've got given some initial conditions. That everything is 0 um, at t equals 0. Find the response of the system. So quick method, we get our equation of motion Okay, for the undriven system. You can find the mechanical matrix. Let me take the, so again, masses, just down the diagonal, OK, times by acceleration. Stiffnesses, I've got down the diagonal is the sum of the stiffnesses connecting each mass to another mass or to each other. OK, and then obviously this is minus the sum of the masses connecting each other. Okay. So I end up getting that as my stiffness matrix. I then multiply the mass matrix by minus omega squared and then combine the two matrices together to get my mechanical convenience matrix. And as I said in the tutorial, I'm not expecting to see that step where you make the substitution and you, you know, write it out and then you write it out again. Okay? If you can work out how to go from this step to this step, then that's fine as well. So there's my mechanical convenience matrix. I take the determinant. Obviously, A times D minus B times C. Okay? I end up getting this. There's my quadratic equation in terms of omega squared. I can solve that using the quadratic formula, okay? And I get two values um, of omega 1 and omega 2, okay? Omega 1 um, is the square root of this, which is 0 0.809 root k upon m, and omega 2 is the square root of this times by root k upon m. So it's 2.312 times k upon m. There's my natural frequencies, okay? And we go through, and this time I've set x1 to be 1 to find the mode shape. So there's the first mode shape, 1 and 0.115. Okay? And the second mode shape is 1 and minus 0.448. So again, two masses moving in the uh, same direction, different amplitudes, and the other mode is them moving in opposite directions. Okay. So there's my two mode shapes. Now, step four, find the modal mass. So I take my mode shape. I transpose it, so it's written horizontally, multiplied by my mass matrix times by my mode shape will give me a value, which is my modal mass, MR. OK, so I go through, I solve. Obviously, here we've got M times by 1 plus 0 times by 1.115. So obviously, that's quite clearly going to be M. And here I've got 0 times by 1 plus 2M times by 0.115. So obviously, that's going to be 2.23M. OK. And then obviously, I take this equation, I do 1 times by m, which is here. And I do 1.115 times 2.23 times by m, which is this term. I add them together, I get 3.486m. That's my modal mass. For mode 2, I do the same thing. m times by 1, OK, m times by 1, plus 0 times by point minus 0.448 is going to be, obviously, m. And then here, I've got 2 times by minus 0.448, so I get minus 0.896 times by m. And again, I go through the process. 1 times by m, minus 0.448 times minus 0.896m. OK, and I get m plus 0.401. I get 1.4014 times by m. That's my modal mass for the, mass, uh, for the second mode. And you can do the same thing for the stiffnesses, OK, to get kr. I go through the same process. I won't go through it, but basically, obviously, here we've got 4k times by 1 minus 3k times by 115, okay, which will give me this term. You add them together. I've got minus 3k times by 1 plus 4k times by 1.115, and that will give me this term. And then again, multiply the matrices together to get something, uh, a modal stiffness in terms of that's for mode 1. And then the modal stiffness for mode 2, same process, go through multiplying matrices out. And you get a second modal stiffness. Rescale the modal mass. OK, so I take my the value I found for m1 and m2. I square root it and divide the mode shape by that value okay, to get my u1 and u2 and so on, which will give me my modal um, thing. So if I go through it, obviously that m term is a, isn't the value. So that's 
That's the left is square root of m down here. Okay. And so obviously this could be 1 upon square root of m times by those two values, and 1 upon square root of m times by those, the other two values for u2. And so my modal matrix, phi, looks like this. Okay. Now, dealing with the applied force, I take the modal matrix, I transpose it, and I multiply it by my applied force. And notice what I get. My applied force for F, uh, P1 was CT, and P2 was 0. And so I multiply this out. I, there's, there's my modal matrix transposed. Obviously, I've got this times by this plus this times by this. So it's quite clearly going to be this times by CT divided by root M. There's my root M. Okay. And here I've got 0.85 divided by root m times by ct for my second one. Now at this point, I make, uh, oh no, not this point. Yeah, I, at this point I do make a substitution. My modal equation will always be in this form, okay? That's what we've done. By scaling that modal mass, it will always be in this form for an undamped system, okay? There is a form for a damped system that includes a term in the middle, but we'll look at that in a minute. But um, in this, it will always be in this form. And what I've done is I've set my equation, my equation up. There's my omega 1 squared. Okay, it was in terms of k upon m, as we saw. There's my equation. There's my, P, uh, my f1, my force. And what I've done is I've made the substitution. I've say, said that this term equals c1, just to make life simple. Okay, and this term equals c2, again, just to make life simple. And so you can see quite clearly that we have q double dot times by omega, okay, well this is q1 double dot, times by omega 1 squared, times by q1 equals c1 times by t. Now, that's quite, that looks quite similar to mx <coughs> double dot plus kx equals ft. Yeah? If m was 1, and k is omega squared, I've got my, so obviously f is c. Uh, we've solved this equation before. Chapter 3, that's the solution. We've got the solution for a linearly increasing forcing function. <laughs> and it happens to be on your equation sheet as well. If you go to page, let's see which page is on. Page 3 of your equation sheet, okay, linearly increasing forcing function, Initially at rest, we've got a force in function. The solution to this equation in terms of x is x equals, we've got in there, minus f upon k omega naught, okay, sine of omega naught times by time, and we've got plus ft upon k. So we've solved this equation in terms of x. Notice that these equations are almost identical to each other. If you set m to be 1, okay, and k to be omega 1 squared, and f to be c1, okay, you can solve that equation. Obviously, we're going to have c1 here. k, we know, is omega naught squared, so we stick that in there. Times by omega naught, well, omega naught squared times by omega naught is omega naught to the power of 3. Sine of omega naught times by t, and then c1 times by t divided by omega naught squared. Okay, you can just match up the equation. Match this equation up okay, with our mx double dot plus kx equals whatever the forcing function is. Okay, if the forcing function is some constant times by t, then you can apply the one that we used in chapter 3. Okay. So if I go through solving that problem, we solved, like I said, we solved that problem before. We solved that problem before from chapter 3, and the solution... Like that, if we didn't know, it, uh, but we know that we've got initially a rest. Okay, so we've got this equation. And like I said, you just match that equation up with your modal equation, and you can then solve it. We don't need to go, basically, that's the mathematical solution to this equation, okay, when you've got initial rest conditions. Okay, don't think about it as, you know, as, you know, obviously we've got, we know this equation is single degree of freedom system, but basically, We've got a differential equation, the mathematical solution to that differential equation, when x of 0 is 0 and x dot of 0 is 0 is that, okay? So therefore, if we've got an equation that has that form, we can apply that as our solution. And so that's what I've done. 
we can find that Q1 is going to be this, and then Q2 will be that in terms of our natural coordinates. So we've got two equations for Q1 and Q2. You can then apply the conversion in step 8, which is that, to get back to x1 and x2. Okay. Now here I've written it in terms of Q1 and Q2, but we know what Q1 and Q2 are because we've just found it in the previous step. Sometimes when you've got Q1 and Q2 and it's quite a long equation, it's fine for you to write that step like that. Okay. Um, you don't have to write out Q1 and Q2 because, again, I'm not, it's not a speed writing competition. It's uh, the exam. It's just a, uh, your understanding of dynamics is the exam. Okay.